thank you for uh, traveling all the way from UK and uh, spending so much of your time here. Uh, like uh, we are very curious uh, to know more about your journey, and uh, like uh, on behalf of my audience, I would like to ask you a few questions. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, you were an orthopedician, and uh, you chose this unusual journey for yourself, uh, the journey of medical education. Yes. So, what was the yeah. inspiration yeah. behind? Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, yeah, I've always been interested in teaching. I think that's really in my genes. Um, so uh, even as a junior house officer, I was concerned to be uh, uh, involved in teaching and uh, was able to do that um, informally at the bedside with other people. When uh, I uh, finished my first postgraduate year, I moved into an anatomy demonstrating uh, role uh, which again is uh, a, a, an active teaching part of the hospital or of the medical school. It was in those days where anatomy was such a, right. a, a, a major topic and related to uh, uh, prosecting and dissecting large classes. I went on to do a, um, a diploma course in medical education, uh, which was provided by uh, the, the Centre for Medical Education at the time. And uh, I felt that gave me um, uh, some credibilities, some credentials uh, to say that yes I really was interested in teaching. I didn't just say I was interested in teaching, I had a diploma to sort of prove it if, uh, if, if you like. Mm -hmm. And it was a very seminal and significant part of, uh, of, of my journey because when I was awarded that diploma one of my tutors said to me, because I was thinking great I've got my diploma that's me, and, and this tutor said to me, John you've got your diploma now you should go on and do a master's in medical education. And that was a seminal moment, and I realised, yes, I should do that. And uh, after a little while, I did a master's um, uh, degree in medical education at the University of Dundee, and it was a, a thesis looking at self-directed learning and uh, mm -hmm. the comparison of groups between a conventional lecture course and a, a self-directed learning course, uh, which is still, to still topical. Yeah. My appointments since then, in, 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 although I was working in orthopaedic surgery, were very much uh, on the academic side, uh, so that I was a, a, a senior lecturer and then a reader in the university, and always had a big influence in the medical school, in the curriculum, in the uh, clinical skills centre. It was a contract which allowed me to do enough clinical work to have a, a, a hands-on orthopaedic practice. Um, but at the same time, we were extensively involved in the undergraduate curriculum, in assessment, in the development of new resources. And one of the things I was especially pleased mm -hmm. with was developing an a, a ambulatory care teaching centre. Okay. So we had a new teaching facility mm -hmm. to bring students in to have invited patients and we could do clinical teaching on, um, without the constraints of actually having to deliver clinical mm -hmm. care at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how I've gone. But now, um, as time has gone by, I've, I, I'm working entirely in AMI, the International Association for Medical Education, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why I'm involved in online courses and uh, teaching and tutoring and attending conferences mm -hmm. and uh, talking to friends to influence and encourage yeah. them too. Sure. So where do you see the future of uh, medical education in the current uh, era of uh, like emerging challenges and things changing very rapidly? Yeah, we have seen a lot of a lot of challenges and, and, and changes which have happened in my professional lifetime, and uh, and I think the challenge the changes bring challenges, and it's interesting to reflect on that just quickly as you, you've asked me that question. Um, one of the things is simulation. Simulation has been a great benefit and, and is so advanced now, and of course mm -hmm. it's possible to simulate uh, with uh, with models and. Uh, 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 expensive uh, mm -hmm. equi equipment mm -hmm. and, and this is very important and in terms of resuscitation of critical care of anesthesiology that these are very, very vitally important mm -hmm. the problem that 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 comes with that extra facility is that there's a danger of thinking we can't teach without it and of course that's not true the simplest simulated model can help you teach some mm -hmm. simple but re relevant True, skills yeah. to a large number of people. So the danger, and, and this is I think particularly appropriate for um, not yourself, but for other, but for in other places, perhaps more underdeveloped situations, where if they think that all they need is an expensive cardiac simulator, that's not necessarily right. Mm -hmm. and it's possible to, to teach effectively mm -hmm. with patient volunteers, with student volunteers, and uh, with much more simple equipment. 
So mm -hmm. the risk of simulation is that we think that that's the only way to do it. Yeah, uh, you have been to so many countries across the world, um, like sharing your expertise. Mm. So what is your experience like, and what is your advice to mm -hmm. those working in uh, low resource settings, mm -hmm. like how to make the most of medical education there? Yeah. I, one of the most interesting uh, experiences I've had is in uh, Australia, in the Rural Clinical School of Western Australia, uh, which is based in Perth, but uh, mm -hmm. teaches all the way up the uh, well, western coast of Australia, in places which are really remote. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this work is similar and to, uh, the work, to the work in Flinders uh, University in Adelaide, uh, where a similar approach is carried out. And the point about this is that it's possible to teach in quite remote and quite um, uh, resource-challenged areas as long as you've got some basic commodities. And the basic commodities which you need are an enthusiastic doctor who is able to teach. True. You need uh, a, a group of patients who represent core clinical problems mm -hmm. and you need an enthusiastic student who is yeah. a actively involved. involved yeah. and, and in that situation a lot can be done because mm -hmm. the clinical material is there, the enthusiasm and the input of a, of a doctor is there and sure. a student who is able to self-direct mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to uh, uh, help themselves learn is great. And well, you might say, well, they won't see the big range of clinical material there. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, that's true. They may be missing out on some cases which people mm -hmm. in the urban cent centre are seeing. Mm -hmm. But that is that you bridge that gap by mm -hmm. virtual patients. So you have a good virtual patient online program, so mm -hmm. students can tune in to uh, the virtual pre the virtual patient demonstration, mm -hmm. which has been filmed elsewhere and is broadcast sure. to them locally. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, what is your advice? You have been to India so many times. Mm -hmm. So yep. what is your advice to people who are working in the field of uh, medical education in India? Mm -hmm. Yes, I've had lots of good visits to uh, India, particularly with ASICON, the, uh, the Indian Association of Orthopaedic Surgeons have invited me right, many yeah. times. I have ha mm -hmm. happy memories of, 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 those, of those visits. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of, of issues. I think uh, uh, the bigger problems, I think, in, in India relating to uh, education are that uh, there are lots of um, medical schools or a lot of universities. There are a number of private medical schools and to get the consistency of standard across the board I think is one of the, the difficulties that um, can you have a consistent standard of teaching, consistent standard of, of, of education and I think that's a national question but as far as I understand that it's, not really been, yeah. it's not really been sorted out yet yeah, so sure. there, are, there are issues there. Um, Obviously, there are large population, lots, lots of health care is needed. And the other question which springs to mind is, do we really need, in every situation, um, a, a totally qualified doctor? Mm -hmm. Or is, in fact, the greater need for a, a health care specialist mm -hmm. or, 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 a, or a, a health um, prevention officer? Mm -hmm. uh, to, to work in some places. Mm -hmm. We're in Britain at the moment, we're seeing much more care being delivered by nurses mm -hmm. uh, uh, rather than by qualified mm -hmm. doctors, doctor, GPs, because yeah. you don't really need that for a lot of True. things. And we, I think we have to readjust our thinking mm -hmm. so that we're not always thinking, well, what I need is a doctor. Mm -hmm. another, another healthcare specialist may just as True. well be able to answer the, pe True. the people's needs. And I just wonder if that's a help uh, uh, for yeah. um, some of the situations in a, in a densely populated country. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you so much for your time and I have one final question. Uh, like what is your advice for uh, uh, like professionals thinking of making a career in medical education? Yeah, that's a good question and that's really why uh, we're here at this, this conference uh, uh, yeah. now in, uh, in, in, in Riyadh. Um, medical education, uh, just to quote a local example, has, has mushroomed here in the, the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And that's very exciting, I think, over the last 17 years, the number of doctors uh, with medical education, has, uh, medical education interest has, has, has mushroomed. Mm -hmm. and, and that's great because it does guarantee that your workforce who is involved in teaching has some knowledge of educational principles. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Amy is offering is um, our online courses and, and this is one of them it's called ESME it stands for essential skills in medical education that's an online course yeah. which people can 
uh, buy into. It lasts for 12 weeks. It covers six key topics in medical education, which people really need to know about to hold a conversation intelligently about what medical education is about. Yeah. And this is one way of giving um, your colleagues in universities or in teaching hospitals some credentials which show that they know something particularly about medical education. This course is designed for students which is also interesting and different. We can empower mm -hmm. students who are interested in teaching with more information about that role. So that's one of several courses available online for a 12 week period and, 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 that's, and that's very good. And the second thing I wanted to, to show you, because this is a, a message maybe to deans and faculty leaders, is the Aspire initiative. And the Aspire initiative, uh, run by Amy, is an international, uh, um, an international initiative to show that you can have excellence in uh, teaching activities. And the one which we've been discussing here today is excellence in student engagement, but it could be also excellence in assessment or excellence in social accountability. As mm -hmm. a medical school, it would be good to have a globally acknowledged, uh, benchmarked qualification, if you like, role recognition, which shows that your medical school has got something which says, yes, it is excellent in this particular aspect of medical education. True. So maybe there's a message there for, for both people starting out in medical education and, and for those who are running a medical school. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor John, for your uh, time. And uh, we are very hopeful that we will continue to receive yeah. the kind of uh, enlightenment and inspiration from you in the coming times. Thank you so Thanks. much. Best wishes. Thank you.